we are going to go over DME introduction to ICTs and computers. Right. Now, the first thing we need to get to understand is what is a computer? Well, we know that a computer is an electronic device that operates under instructions, and these instructions are stored in its own memory, right? According to specified rules, which produce information as output. Now, here you have got a computer. Now, this computer doesn't operate by its own self. According to the one who set it and the instruction that it has been given, that is how and the way it gets to operate. So it's going to operate on the uh, set of uh, instruction that has, it has been given. So it is able to accept input, all right? It is now going to get and process this input into an output, okay? So this input that we get to put in a computer that is going to be called data because it's not meaningful. By the time it gets to come out, it is now information because it is now meaningful, right? So this is a computer, something that it does not control itself, which just has instructions that it has to follow, right? Now, what are the functions of a computer? One, any digital computer, now we've got a lot of computers. This includes our Android phones, our PCs, and so many, many more, like uh, even washing machines. All these are just machines that get to work under the instructions that have been given once they are switched on. So computers get to take in data as input. They are going to be able to store the data in their memory. Okay, and whenever that data is needed, they are going to uh, produce it to, uh, for use. Apart from being able to store the data that you've put in, they are able to process data. They can also generate data. How do they do this? By get, getting to process the data that you've given them, right? So you've given them the instruction to do so. They're going to process anything that you give them, depending on the instruction that you've given them. And a computer can also do all these things. So it controls, actually it controls all these things, taking in the data, storing the data, processing the data, and also generating the output. The computer controls all these uh, processes. So these are the functions of a computer. Right, so when you're talking about a computer, this is a basic computer that we're able to see here. So we're going to get to put data right so data when you are inputting data mostly that you are going to use the hardware right and the data you are going you you are, you are you are you are putting in the central processing unit of a computer so that it gets processed and by the time it is processed it is going to come out as information it can come uh, for it to come out of course as information that will be the central processing unit the cpu that gets to process that so get to give the computer that data the central processing unit gets to work on that and then the information is going to be delivered. All right, so you have got data and information. So all computer processing require data, like there they, they cannot be processing without data. How can you process something that is not there? Okay, so data is simply a collection of raw facts, meaning that facts that are not meaningful can be figures, and symbols such as numbers, words, images, or videos, and sound. So the computer is going to manipulate data to create information. So the computer is going to be able to interpret all these kind of uh, data that you have here, the figures, the symbols, uh, such as numbers, and we are going to have now information out of there. So information is now the data which is being organized, meaningful, and now useful. All right, because it's no longer a row, but it has been processed. So during the output phase, the information that has been created is put into some form, such as printed form. So for example, I was typing. I was typing, I was giving the computer data. So the computer is also interpreting what I'm typing, producing information, what I'm able to see on the screen as I'm getting to type. All right. And when I get to type, I can now have that meaningful information which the computer has interpreted printed out or i can have sound right we can get the sound so the information can also be put into a computer storage for future use right now why is it that a computer is so powerful well something that doesn't think for itself why is it that it is so powerful one the computer 
has the ability to perform the information processing cycle with amazing speed. So it is so powerful because it is so fast. It, it can do something within a very shortest period of time. And it is reliable. You, you are sure to trust the computer even when you are typing or when you are doing something. So it is reliable. It is trustworthy. It is also accurate. So there, there is just that kind of accuracy. Like mistakes have been reduced when it comes to a computer. You can think of it when you are writing a letter with your hands, you'll not be able to tell if you've missed a comma, but the computer is going to be able to tell you when there is grammar error. So that is accuracy. Now, a computer is so powerful also because it is able to store huge amounts of data and information. And also it has got the ability to communicate with other computers. So a computer can communicate with other computers via network and some other things. So that is why a computer is so, so powerful. Right. Now, how does a computer know what to do? So as we said, a computer doesn't control itself. So it has got a set of instructions which are called computer programs. So these computer programs are what tells the computer what exactly to do. So before processing a specific job, the computer program corresponds to that job, corresponding to that job must be stored. For example, this computer you are designed uh, to be printing out, right? So you've already put in the, that computer, that instruction for printing out. So by the time you are putting in data in this computer, was going to receive instructions to be able to ask to print it out because those are the instructions that's been given. So that is what we call a computer program. So once the program is stored in memory, the computer can start the operation by executing the program instructions one after the other. So the, you, you have the program or the instructions in the memory of the computer. So once the computer has got that program or the instruction is there, so the computer now is able to carry out those functions one by one, right? We have got different types of computers. We have got desktop computers. These are computers which are which have been connected to a power and you get to use them when they're on power like that. You have got laptops, notepads, uh, no, notebooks. You have got tablets, iPads. You've got smartphones like our Android smartphones. All these are types of computers. Okay. We also have large scale computers like many frame computers, the server, the supercomputer. These are computers which are used to do like very, very fast uh, calculations. Okay, these are very big computers that are able to process data at a very fast rate. Okay, like you, you need computers, for example, in banks. You have got very, very big computers which get to do a very big computation of money. For example, when you are withdrawing uh, 50,000 at error, who is going to start counting 50,000 to give you? So there are computers which are going to do such a work in a very quickest possible time and you are going to be able to receive that money, right? So those from those we have got many frames, supercomputers, which can do also fast calculation like supercomputers, main computers and servers, right? Now, we also have embedded computers. For example, a portable DVD player. We have got dishwashers. Okay, we have got laboratory uh, or functional and molecular. This is the MRI. Mostly it is understood by medical students. You know, it is, it is something that is very important when it comes to when you want to treat patients, you want to check up some things in their bodies in the MRI. So get to put them there. So all these are also types of computers. We call them embedded computers. Okay, now what are the components of a computer? So a computer basically has got two components, the hardware and the software. The hardware is the portion of the computer that you are able to touch and see. The software includes the programs which control the computer and which gives the instructions to a computer of what they're supposed to do. Okay, so the computer hardware includes the keyboard, touch screen, mouse, microphone, camera, uh, stylus, scanners. These are things that you are able to see and touch. Now, if we look at the touch screen itself, okay, so. I, what I want to talk about is something else. I'm going to mention that. So you can see if it is a keyboard, 
like these are things that you are able to see and touch, right? So anything that you are able to see and touch on a computer that you are going to call it as a hardware. Okay, so on the hardware, we've got some devices which are called input devices, others are outputs. So we can look at computer hardware output, meaning that these are the ones which give us information after we've put information in the computer. So this includes a monitor. For example, we're going to see what you are writing on the monitor. So that is output. You have got projectors. You get to see also what someone is presenting. You've got printers, which are going to give you, for example, after typing, we're going to have your information on paper. You have got sound output like a speaker. So all these speakers are going to give you information. So these are output devices. You also have a touch screen. Okay, A touch screen is also an output device. For example, now, a touch screen is both output and input. For example, we're going to be typing on the touch screen that is inputting. And then at the same time, you are going to be seeing what you're typing that is outputting. So it is both input and output. So you can see here we've got computer hardwares and softwares. So the hardware, these are the physical, tangible, meaning things that you're able to touch, tangible parts of a computer, which includes keyboard, monitor, wires, chips, and data. Okay. We also have now software, which are programs and data. So these are programs which get to control a computer. So what is a program? It's simply a series, a series of instructions that get to tell the computer what to do. So a computer requires both hardware and software. Like you, it can't, you can't have a computer if you only have hardware without software. Like it's not, it not be working. And you can't have software if there's no hardware, right? So you need both. So each is essentially useless without the other. Like imagine you've got you've got a phone that doesn't respond every time you are trying to to press on there. Like you totally don't have anything on the phone, so it is useless, right? And you can't have software. You can't have a program if there is no hardware to input that program. So everything is useless without the other, right? So we have got a computer hardware motherboard this is a motherboard is small the one which gets to control the rest of the computer okay so i've got a, a motherboard okay a motherboard is simply a circuit board where you get to connect everything else on a computer like everything else is connected there that gets to control the computer now the motherboard contains a processor memory connectors and expansion slots Right, so those are some things that you're able to find on the motherboard. Now, if you look at the computer, you've got uh, the CP, which is the central processing unit, and uh, many memory. So, what is the difference really between this a CPU, central processing unit, and many memory? So, when you have got a computer, you have got first the many memory, and you have got the central processing unit. So, information is able to be changed between the many memory and the CPU. Okay, so just on the main memory, that is the other name for main memory is the random access memory or RAM. We need to know that. That's the other name. So for the main memory, this is the primary storage area for programs and data that are in active use. For example, right now as I'm getting to present, what is able to store what is on on this uh, slide, which I have, is the main memory, such that even if I press the back key and come back, I'm able to find it, right? So that is the main memory. But if I switch off the PC, I'm not going to find this information, which is here, to be out. So the main memory is a primary storage, and it's primary because it is not, it doesn't store forever. You just get to store something that is in active use. Now, the central processing unit is what gets to execute uh, program commands okay it, it it's the one which gets to in other words say this is what the computer has been taught to do so you need to do it all right so that is the central processing unit but here again we have got the secondary memory storage remember we've talked about the primary memory storage which is the main memory or random access memory ram we've also the secondary memory now secondary memory uh, devices provide long-term storage like these are devices which can be just connected to a computer for example you get to put a disk okay a floppy disk a hard disk these have got information right they've got information that you uh, is stored okay you can think of something like a flash so 
examples of me secondary memory we've got hard disk floppy disk zip disk uh, readable cds ta uh, tapes we also have information okay so information is able to be moved between the central processing unit and the main memory so information can be moved between the main memory and the secondary memory if we refer to the main memory in this case many memory refers to what to random access memory like the memory which the computer has okay that is able to store things just in active use so you can change information can be transferred like from a disk to the main memory from the main memory to a disk and also from the main memory to the cpu like that so information can flow like that okay but you can transfer information directly from the from a hard disk to the central processing unit it has first to go through the main memory now we have got input and output devices what gets to happen so you are going to have a hard disk you can have a hard disk giving information to the main memory or the random access memory the random access memory can give that information to the central processing unit central processing unit is going to process that information you are able now to see it on the what on the monitor okay on the screen or you can have a keyboard you are typing the information is going to go direct to the central processing unit the central processing unit is going to interpret that information it can also be stored okay in like when it is in menus like the way i'm typing you're able to see what i'm writing so that is the main memory there and then from the main memory i can transfer that information to any disk a floppy disk or a hard disk right so this is what is able to happen all right so on computers we also need to understand analog versus digital so what's the difference between analog and digital so analog and digital these are just basic ways to store and manage data like how do you get to manage and store your data so when you're talking about analog the way you get to store data in analog is that the data is continuous and in direct proportion to the data represented okay music on a record album is an example Okay, a need to write on ridges in the grooves that are directly proportional to the voltage sent to the speaker. Like in analog, you think of music on a record disc, uh, record album. Like it's continuous. Basically, we're not talking about analog. The data is stored continuously. For example, one after the other, one after the other. You can think of that. So now if you're talking of digital, the information is broken down into pieces and each piece is represented separately. For example, music on a compact disc. So the disc stores numbers corresponding specific voltage levels, simplified and various uh, points, okay? As, I mean, sampled at various points. So that's on this, remember we're referring to digital and analog. We are saying digital information is going to be represented in broken down units, right? So we are said it can be numbers that are put, right? So computers store all information digitally. They don't store the information continuously like in an analog. So they store the information in forms of numbers, text, graphics and images, audio, video, or program instructions. So in some way, all computers are digitized. So information is broken down into pieces and represented as numbers. So each number represents something or each, each uh, character that is going to be input is going to be represented by a certain number. So each information is broken down. Okay. Like for example, each character in a number or spaces, digits, punctuation are represented by a certain number. For example, just the H here you can see is represented by 72. Okay, we have got uh, the H and the I by 72. You've got also a comma, even a space is going to have its own representation, a number that is representing it. That is what we mean by information is digitized. Now, this information is presented like computer language is in form of binary numbers. Now, from just the word binary, that means two. So once information is digitized, 
when it is represented as numbers, it, rep it is represented and, and stored in the main memory using binary number system. So remember, each character is digitized, represented by numbers. But th that those numbers are stored in binary system, like they are stored as either 0 or 1. So a single binary digit, a binary digit, either 0 or 1 is called a bit. Okay? So a bit is simply 0 or 1. That is a single binary digit. So devices that store and move information are cheaper and more reliable if, the, if they only have represent two states. Well, for example, you, you have got one. Think of one representing on and zero representing off. So this is a binary system. Okay. So combination of these bits. Remember, bit is just 0 or 1. Combination of, of these bits are the ones now which are used to store values. Okay, combination of bits are the ones which gets to we get to use to store values. For example, when you're talking about one bit, one bit contains only what? Only two elements or two combinations. And then you have got two bits, which uh, represents four items. Three bits is going to represent another. Now, how do you get to, to find this? So there's a very simple formula that we get to use. Okay, each combination can be represented, a, can represent a particular item. So there are two to the power n combinations of any bits, meaning that if you have got one bit to be two to the power one, if you have got two bits, two to the power two, three bits, two to the power three. So if they say a computer has got a, Let's just kiss the four items. How many bits are represented by these items? So I'm going to say kiss the four is equal to two to the power n. Remember, n is what represents the bits. Okay, kiss the four can also be written as two to the power. Is it six? And that is going to be equal to two to the power n. So meaning that n is equal to six. So I've got six bits represents kiss the four items. Now. If you look at the computer, if you get to understand the computer, a computer, we have got what you call computer specifications. Like when you're referring to a computer, you, you need to specify a computer, like talking about it's uh, how big is it, how much data is it able to store. Those are what we call computer specifications. So you consider the following, like for example, you're going to say my computer is 2.4 uh, gigahertz. I tell, Intel was i7, it is eight, it has a 8 GB RAM, it has got one TB hard disk, a 24 times speed CD-ROM drive, it is 17, 17 inches, multimedia video display of 1280 by 1024 resolution, one GB modem. So what does all this mean? This is what we call computer specification. So this is what gets to tell you what your computer is or its inner composition, all right? Like how much it is able to store, how fast it is, how big it is. So first three, we have got memory, right? Now memory is divided into many memory and you know that memory, of course, you have got many memory for a computer, right? So many memory uh, is divided into many memory locations or cells okay so the main memory is going to be divided into cells and each memory cell has a numeric address which uniquely identifies it so each cell has got its own address which uniquely identifies it for example 9286 that is what identifies that cell okay so now how do you store information so each memory cell stores a set of numbers of bits, usually eight bits. So as you get to store information in a cell, remember each cell has got its own unique representation of numbers. But information in a cell, since it's a mem main memory which gets to store information, information in a cell is stored as in bits. Okay, we know that a bit is just a combination of one and a zero. Now. When you're talking about, if you get eight bits, this is going to give you one uh, byte. If you get eight bits, you are going to get one byte. And that is how you get to store information in, in cells.
Okay, so we can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight bits or one byte gives you the form in which you store information in each cell, which is each uniquely represented. All right, now we also have storage capacity. Okay, we also have storage capacity of a computer. So each memory device has a storage capacity. Now, in what does a storage capacity do? So that indicates the number of bytes it can hold. Like how many bytes are you able to hold? How many bytes can that computer hold? All right. So the capacities are going to be represented by these units. We've got the kilobyte, the megabyte, gig, uh, gigabyte, and terabyte. Now going to hear my uh, my computer is uh, one TB. Okay. That is how much number of bytes is able to store now notice this is bytes not bits that's the number of bytes that a computer is able to store for example just here now we need to understand this because the way they get to phrase questions the person can be confused a bit so in one kilobyte we have got two to the power 10 bytes in one megabyte we've got two to the power 20 one gigabyte we've got two to the power 30 one terabyte we've got two to the power 40. Now the thing is this, a kilobyte is smaller than a megabyte, okay? Like if you are comparing a kilobyte and a megabyte, this one is a thousand. Mega, it is a million. Giga is a billion, okay? And then Terra is a trillion. So you see how they differ, they all differ by three. They all differ by three. But when you're considering in terms of how many bytes they are able to store, you are, they are going to be differing each by power, uh, power 10. So the smallest is a kilobyte, which is 2 to the power 10, and that represents bytes. Okay? So in a one, ter, uh, one kilobyte, so we're saying one kilobyte is equal to one, uh, 1,024 bytes. Okay? This is what we have. That is one kilobyte, which is 1,024 bytes, okay? And then one megabyte is 2 to the power 10. So now they can ask, for example, how many kilobytes are in a megabyte? They can ask such questions. So how do you get to calculate that? All right, or someone is going to ask how many bytes are in a kilobyte or a terabyte or a megabyte? So to be able to find that, for example, let's find how many megabytes, are, I mean, how many bytes are in a megabyte. Now, we already know that in one megabyte, we have got 10 to the power 20 bytes. We can just punch this on a gadget and we're going to find the answer. Okay. Now, that means that one megabyte, since it has 2 to the power 20 bytes, we know that 2 to the power 20 is the same as what? 2 to the power 20 is the same as 2. Uh, we can write also this. Since we can break down the 20, this is going to be 2 to the power 10. Okay. Multiplied by 2 to the power 10. We know that same bases multiplying. What do we add to the powers? We do add. Okay. We add the powers. So that will be 10 plus 10. That gives us power 20. Right. This means that in one megabyte, we know that 2 to the power 10 is equal to what? Is equal to a kilobyte. So this means that in one megabyte, we have got where there's 2 to the power 10 bytes. I'm going to put one megabyte, isn't it? I'm going to put one megabyte. And then where there's this 2 to the power 10, I'm going to put 1024. That means that in one megabyte, we have got 1024 kilobytes. This was supposed to be kilobytes, not megabytes. So this is how you, questions are able to come. So they, they're asking that you get to, to find how many kilobytes. Let's, for example, find how many kilobytes are in a gigabyte. Okay, how many kilobytes are in a gigabyte? So to be able to find that, we know that in one gigabyte, we have got 2 to the power 30 bytes and i can divide this in uh, 2 to the power 10 so that means we've got 2 to the power 10 multiplied by 2 to the power 10 multiplied by 
2 to the power 10, right? And you know that uh, 2 to the power 10 multiplied by 2 to the power 10, that is going to give us uh, 2 to the power 20. That means that uh, 1 gigabyte is the same as, what is 2 to the power 10? 2 to the power 10, we know that is 1,024. We can punch on our, our calculators. That's 124. But 2 to the power 10 times 2 to the power 10, that is 2 to the power 20. And you know that 2 to the power 20 is what? Is a megabyte. That means 1 gigabyte is the same as 2 to the power 24 megabytes. Okay. I could have also said, okay, 1 GB is the same as, this is 2 to the power 10, which is 10, 24 times this other 2 to the power 10 is also 10, 24. This 2 to the power 10 is also 10, 24. But these are what? These are bytes. That means that 1 gigabyte is the same as 2 to the power 20, 2, 1024, 1024, 1024 bytes. So if you want to find how many kilobytes are in a gigabyte, this other one, this other one which is here, the 124, we know that one kilobyte is the 124 bytes. So I can put a kilobyte there. Okay, so that means one megabyte is the same as 1024 times 1024 kilobytes. So this is how we're able to convert. Now, if they want us to find the number of bytes in any of these, for example, how many bytes are in a kilobyte? We know that one kilobyte, let me just get remove something here. All right, so we know that in one kilobyte, we have got what? We have got 1024 bytes. Now we want to find how many bits are in one kilobyte. So say one kilobyte is equal to, of course we know that just one byte is equal to eight bits. So I'm just going to multiply. So here we're going to say what of 1024 bytes. How many bits are there? X. So multiply 1024 by 8. Meaning that one kilobyte has got 8 times 1024 bits. So this is how we're able to calculate this in case they, they wanted us to do the calculations or the computations here. Right. So we need also to know that many memory, the main memory is volatile, meaning that information which is stored in the main memory is not permanent. Once you switch off the, the computer or power goes, the information is going to be lost. So main memory said, uh, we can think of also RAM. RAM is also the other term that we use for main memory. Okay, so main memory or RAM is volatile. But secondary memory, for example, a disk is non-volatile, meaning that the information stored there cannot be lost when power goes. So main memory and disks are direct access memories. The main memory and disk are direct access uh, memories or devices. Why? Because information can be reached directly. That's why we call them direct access. For example, main memory, like you can directly access the the data okay the term direct access and random access are often used interchangeably the magnetic tape is a sequential access device since its data is arranged in a linear order you must get by the intervening data in order to access the information so what i want us to to know here is that the main memory and disks the information can be what can be accessed directly now What's the difference between RAM, random access memory, and ROM? Okay. So the term RAM and many memory, we said they are basically interchangeable, right? Now, ROM, just ROM. ROM could be a set of memory chips or a separate device, okay? It can be a separate device or just, a, just some memory chips, such as a CD, all right? That is going to be ROM. But both ROM and RAM are random or direct access devices like you can access the information directly so probably ram should be called read write memory why why should we probably call ram as read write memory the reason is simple that is because when we're talking about ram immediately power goes it, it stops working okay it stops working so you can only read the data if power is on that is why we say read 
right memory. So you think of this because the question can come, that should probably be called read right memory. You are going to think it's wrong because you have even a read there. No, it is not. Right. So the central processing unit, CPU, is also called a microprocessor. So it continuously follows the fetch, decode, execute cycle. In other words, what happens is that it's first going to fetch information, it's going to so to fetch is just to retrieve an instruction from the main memory. So it's, it's going to get the instruction from the main memory and then it's going to decode. Now to decode is to determine what the instruction is. All right. So it is going to determine what the information is, is and then it's going to execute. To execute is now to carry out the information. So this is the, the, the process that it, the main memory, I mean the CPU gets to use. It fetches the information, decodes the information and then executes the information. Right. So here is the central processing unit. So the central processing unit has got different parts. We have got the arithmetic logic unit, also called uh, A, AOU. We have got the control unit, also called CU, and we have got registers. Now the ar arithmetic logic unit, just from the word arithmetic, these are the ones which get to perform calculations and make decisions, right? That is the part of the CPU that gets to make the the, the decision and then the control unit is what coordinates processing steps so it gets to coordinate like connect the steps for processing if you want to process something the one which is going to control that is going to be the control unit and then the arithmetic logic unit is going to make a decision all right and then we've got registers which are just the small storage areas within the central processing unit so here, the central processing unit is controlled by what is called the system's clock. Please, we need to know this. The speed of the CPU is controlled by the system's clock. Okay, the system's clock is going to generate an electronic pulse at regular intervals. So the pulse is now going to connect activities of the CPU. And the speed of the CPU is measured in gigahertz. We also need to know this. Speed of the CPU is measured in gigahertz. Now, for a monitor, a monitor, we know that that's the screen, right? The screen of the of our computer. The size of this of a monitor is measured diagonally, like a television. So when you're measuring the, the size, you get to measure it like this. You don't measure like how long it is like this or how long it is like that. Okay, so that is how you measure the size of the PC or the monitor. So a monitor has also a, a certain maximum resolution. So a resolution is simply uh, the number of picture elements that it can be able to display. So a monitor has got a certain maximum resolution, like how many, what's the maximum number of pictures that this screen or this monitor is able to display, okay? Now those pictures or picture elements, we call them pixels. So you are going to see represented as maybe uh, 1,280 by 1,024. This is telling you the maximum number of picture elements that that uh, monitor is able to display. So high resolution means more pixels. So in other words, more picture elements, and that produces more sharper pictures. So if your computer has got a high resolution, meaning that the pictures are going to be more sharp and more clearer. You also have a modem for a computer. Now, what is a modem? So a modem, simply data transfer device that allows information to be sent and received between computers. So I've got one computer here connected to another computer, okay? So a modem is a, is a data transfer device that is going to make sure that data is transferred between these two computers. So many computers include a modem Okay, many computers include a modem when you get to buy them, which allows information to be moved across a telephone line. So a data transfer device has a maximum data transfer rate. So there's a maximum rate at which you're able to transfer data. For example, a modem, for instance, may have a data transfer rate of 56,000 bits per second. So I'm going to represent that as BPS. That is how fast it's able to 
to transfer. It can transfer 56,000 bits on in a sequence, so it is so fast. So that is it for now, and this is where we're going to end.